this kind of rainy Thursday weekend to a wonderful talk that will be shortly presented by Joan Martino, the curator of the Prudence Grand Museum in Canterbury, Connecticut. So guys, show it again. Who has heard of Prudence Grand before? So we have we go to Joan, you can put your hand down. None of that. So we have three, we have three in the audience who have heard of Prudence Grand. And so in the last month, I personally, oh, I've introduced myself. I'm Charlie McMahon, I'm the program manager here for the Pequot Library. And so in the last month, in prep for this talk, I've done my own research on Prudence Spandau. And while I was familiar with her before, I didn't know that much. And now I'm shocked that she has not talked about more. In Connecticut history, in national history, the woman has had a massive, massive impact. And so being able to look around our state of Connecticut and see that sort of advocacy and that impact from such an early period. More than we're about, it's the 1830s, right? This is this is preceding a, a good chunk of the abolition movement, okay? And so, because my background is not in this, and you guys don't want to hear me talk anymore, I'm going to turn this over to Joe DiMartino. Thank you guys so much for coming. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Charlie and the Pequot Library for inviting me to speak here. And I want to thank you all, each and every one of you, for coming out on such a dreary February evening uh, to listen to an amazing talk. I hope you uh, enjoy um, this conversation that we're going to have. And um, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions throughout. We can have a Q&A afterwards. Um, I can talk about this literally for hours, but I promise to not keep you that long unless you stay engaged and, <laughs> and answer questions and ask questions. Um, but uh, a little bit about this building. Um, this is the Prudence Crank on the exam, and uh, we just completed a two-year restoration process. We opened up quietly last summer, uh, and I'm launching a new exhibit uh, this summer um, that's going to be the whole first floor of the museum that tells the story that you're going to be hearing today uh, in even more detail, actually. But we are a National Historic Landmark in Canterbury, Connecticut. And the reason we're a National Historic Landmark is because what happens here here in the far corner of the state uh, really played a role in shaping the nation. It impacted two U.S. Supreme Court cases and laid the foundation for the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. So um, as Charlie mentioned earlier, uh, it is really a significant series of events that occurred here uh, in Canterbury, and um, I'm happy to, to share this story with you tonight. Um, so we go to the first thank you. So this is probably the most famous image of Prudence Crandall. We do have photographs of her later in life, but this portrait was painted at the height of the events that were occurring in Canterbury. Crandall herself was born in 1803 in Hopkinson, Rhode Island. Her family moved to Canterbury to be closer to a Quaker community that was outside of Plainfield at that time. Uh, Quakers believed in the importance of education. I know this is part of this amazing exhibit that the Pequot Library has had um, uh, ongoing for May, and uh, I urge everybody, because I know I'm, and this is being live streamed as well, to come and see it if you haven't already. It's a gorgeous exhibit. Uh, but Prince Crandall's family, as Quakers, firmly believed in the importance of education and they believed in the importance of equality for everyone. So combining those two, the Crandall family, who had four children, two boys and two girls, they educated their daughters as well as their sisters. So Prudence Crandall and her younger sister, Hannah Almira Crandall, were sent to the Moses Brown School. Uh, at the time, it had the name, very long name, of the New England Yearly Annual Quakers Meeting School, but <laughs> the founder was Moses Brown, and so it is now named after him, and it's still in existence. But that was where she got her education. And she returned to the Canterbury area after she graduated, and she was teaching in what we know today, what we call one-room schoolhouses. Uh, they were just for the schools that one more time. Um, but she was teaching in the, uh, outside the Plainfield area and in Lisbon, and she was getting a really good reputation as a teacher. 
So Canterbury at this time um, is losing residents that are going out west to seek their fortune, um, and they want to draw a little more prominence to the town. And there's this local young woman who uh, is a noted educator, and they decide, the leading town citizens, that they're going to ask her to start a school in their town. Um, they want to bring some prominence, and women's education is becoming more and more established. Uh, previously, women were really only taught to maybe write their first name and read the Bible, but the idea of women's education during the early 19th century is originated because um, we're the new republic, right? Like Greek was, Greece was the old republic, and we were going to be a democracy. We were going to have educated voters. Who are their sons' first teachers but the mothers? So you have women like Emma Willard, whose books incidentally are the exhibit. Um, and she is talking about the importance of women's education and why uh, women should be educated equally as well. So you have this combination here occurring with this increase in literacy and education. Um, and in Connecticut in particular, you have Sarah Pierce out of Litchfield starting an academy. Catherine Beecher is starting a seminary for women in um, Hartford, Mary Lyons in Massachusetts. You know, she, she found that was a fairly uh, well-known school that even Emily Dickinson had spent for some time in her life. So you start seeing this happening, and Kingsbury sees this as a real opportunity. So they get sprinted off to she start a school um, in the town. So they also do not have to send their daughters to the exploring school, be right in the backyard. So she purchased the, the um, property that you saw earlier. It was at the time um, the estate of Luther King. And you don't know much about him. He seems to have been a merchant, but he was uh, very wealthy. The house is commodious. It's 4,000 square feet. It's three quarters of an acre. And it is perfect for running a boarding school. It's right on the corner. It's still to this day at a junction of 14 and 169. And um, it is a, a great location right across from the Canterbury. So in 1831, she purchases the building and she starts the school. So at age 28, she is a business owner. She is a property owner for a young, unmarried woman. This is, this is already success for her. Um, and she has about 25 students that are attending the school. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. This is an image that John Barber created of Canterbury Green at the time. If you look over in the corner there, this is what it looked like in the 1830s. Uh, letter A, and you can see the designation that he made as Miss Crandall School. And uh, the school was successful. She had, as I mentioned, you know, about 25 students. She had a board of visitors, which is what we would call our board of education today, that were writing. Um, uh, well-received uh, um, articles and advertisements in newspapers, and uh, just kind of sharing information about um, the subjects that she was teaching. And uh, it was a pretty rigorous curriculum. She's teaching astronomy. She has a chemistry lecturer that's coming on Tuesday evenings. Um, they are learning geography and uh, your standard math and uh, other sciences, as well as um, you know, English grammar, um, you could also uh, take piano lessons, you could take French lessons. Now, that sounds very much like a finishing school, but I have to say that French was the global language of commerce in the 1830s, the way English is today. So for these students to be learning French, um, that was pretty significant for this time. Um, Bernice Randall, as I mentioned, she has her sister, Hannah Elmira, also teaching at the school. And she has a, a few other teachers, but she can't do it all herself. She's the principal of this school. So she hires a household assistant, a young African-American woman whose name was Mariah Davis. It's spelled Maria, but it's pronounced Mariah. There's no H at the end. And Mariah Davis had moved to the Canterbury area to be closer to the young man that she was engaged to marry. And his name was Charles Harris. The Harris family was from uh, Norwich, Connecticut, and they moved to Canterbury in 1832 to be farmers. Um, William Harris and his son Charles were agents of the Liberator newspaper, which had just recently been started by William Lloyd Garrison, famous abolitionist um, out of Massachusetts. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Is We'll keep going. <laughs> sure. So 
The Harrises were agents of the liberation, which meant that they took the subscriptions, they delivered the newspaper to uh, any of the subscribers in the surrounding areas. If you look at as early as 1831, William Harrison's name is listed uh, in, in the newspaper as, as, an, as an agent. Um, so Martin Timmis starts reading copies of the Liberator to Crandall's school, um, and she's sharing the Liberator with Prudence Crandall. Um, now, of course, Crandall at this time was, you know, anti-slavery, but she really was an abolitionist or involved in, in kind of the Quaker uh, tradition of, of abolitionism, kind of think of St. Lucretia Mott. Um, but she is aware of, of what is going on in the nation. And my idea is, I can't stress enough how great it was for her to bring what was essentially a controversial newspaper to her place of employment. Uh, Prudence Randolph could have said that she didn't want that there and, you know, and let Mariah Davis go, but she doesn't. She reads the newspaper and she starts having dialogues with Mariah Davis. Um, so Mariah Davis is encouraged to sit in on the classes when she's finished her tasks for the day. And the literature at this time, I have to mention, was publishing the writings of another African-American woman named Mariah Stewart. Mariah Stewart was from Hartford, Connecticut originally, now living at this time in Boston. And Mariah Stewart is writing some really important articles at this time on the lack of educational opportunities for African-American women beyond the one-room schoolhouse. There, was, there were no higher education opportunities for young Black women. Uh, there, were, there was an attempt to start a school of higher education for young African-American men in New Haven in 1831, but that didn't even get off the ground when it went to a vote to the town 700 men, and remember, women couldn't vote back then. 700 men voted against it, and only four voted for that school. Uh, so that school uh, did not end up uh, becoming into existence. Many of the people who supported the idea of that school did turn their interest in supporting Crandall School, and I'll get to that. Can we get to the next slide, please? So that's uh, an image of Mariah Stewart's, uh, one of her uh, title pages. Um, she published uh, several different uh, essays and, and books, um, but what she was writing in The Liberator coincides with the exact time that Prudence Crandall was reading. So Crandall was getting an education from Mariah Davis at the same time that she is um, uh, you know, teaching as well. So Mariah Davis's soon-to-be sister-in-law is a young woman named Sarah Harris, whose name you've probably heard a little more prominently in the uh, Prudence Crandall story. It's a very important name. Sarah Harris is a very important person. Um, she, at the time, was 20 years old, and she was in domestic service at another house uh, down the street from Prudence Crandall School. So she was coming to visit her soon-to-be sister-in-law, Mariah Davis, and so Crandall Davis and Harris are having conversations about the lack of educational opportunities. Sarah Harris does not want to spend the rest of her life in domestic service. She wants to be a teacher. That is her goal. So in the fall of 1832, she gets up the courage to ask Prudence Crandall if she can also attend her school because she knows that the education that she would receive from Crandall would help her reach her goals. And so she asks Prudence Crandall. Does anybody know what Prudence Crandall responds? What does she say? Okay, she says nothing. Actually, <laughs> she does not respond at all. Sarah has asked three or four times. Um, according to Prudence Crandall, her repeated solicitations were more than I could bear. And uh, she goes on to say that she decides that no matter what may happen, she was going to admit Sarah Harris as a full-time student. Crandall was concerned how the town was going to respond to Sarah Harris um, integrating the school. And she was right to be concerned. We know uh, from the, the history of the story, the town did not respond very well at all. This is a picture of Sarah Harris later in life. There are no images of Sarah Harris at the time uh, of the, uh, the, the school. 
There is a sampler that is now a literature that is attributed to Sarah Harris that she probably created for her family when she was living in Norwich. Um, but as far as images of her, they don't seem to exist. I like to say they haven't yet been discovered. Um, so Sarah Harris becomes the first official African-American student in Purdue's Crandall School. And it doesn't mean that the students had any issues with her attending uh, as, a, as a student along with them but her parents did have issues. And so the town right away starts pressuring the prudence crank to expel Sarah Harris, which she absolutely refuses to do. She doesn't agree to teach Sarah Harris right away, but once she makes that decision, she stands by her convictions. And she uh, is first met with a minister's wife who tells her she has to expel Sarah Harris or her school will sink. And her response is, well, that may sink for I shall not do that. And then a committee can then meet with her. They're increasing the pressure on her to expel Sarah Harris. And she absolutely refuses. So she realizes, though, as the town is beginning to withdraw their daughters from the school, she's going to have a school if you know, she continues down the path that she's on. Um, and that will not help anybody. So she develops a, a different plan. She writes to William Lloyd Garrison. That's just a picture of the museum before we close. <laughs> That's actually a comment that Prudence Crandall made um, that it was unpleasant news for her that her students were going to leave, but she continued her meeting with Sarah Harris at school. She writes to William Lloyd Garrison. She does not know him. So remember, this is an unmarried woman writing to a man she's never met. And she said to him, sir, you do not know me. Uh, I am uh, the principal of this very successful school in Canterbury, but I want to tell you why I'm writing. Um, she wants to change her student body from white students to non-white students. And she thinks she can make a success of it. She's not sure she can get enough students just from Connecticut, but if she can reach out to families in Philadelphia, in New York City, in Boston, in Providence, Rhode Island, she thinks she can get enough students and can help her uh, by introducing her to people. And by the way, I'm coming to Boston in a few days and we're going to meet. So, so be ready. I'll let you know when I arrive. She doesn't even wait for him to respond. She leaves her sister managing the school <laughs> and she goes off to Boston and meets with William Lowe Garrison, who does think that she could make a success of her school. And what he does, it's very important, is that he writes letters of introduction for her to African-American ministers in the free Black communities in these cities. And that's very important. Remember, there's no LinkedIn at the time. There is no Facebook. There's no way to see. There's, you know, there's no resumes or CDs. If somebody claims that they are who they say they are. So having those letters of introduction from Garrison was very important to the success of her school as well. And she goes to these places. She doesn't just write them letters or just advertise in the Liberator, which she does do, um, but she goes to these families, she goes to these ministers and meets them and sits with them and talks to these parents and answers their questions and concerns and listens to them. And uh, they do start sending their daughters to the school. You can see the next slide. This here is a um, a copy or a, you know a reproduction of uh, the advertisement that she does place in the Liberator, and you can see the subjects that she taught. The only subject that was being taught to the white students that was not being taught when her school was for African American students is rhetoric that was brought to the Liberator. We're not sure why, um, and it went from a kind of a la carte menu to a full package menu. So um, French was included in this package. Uh, piano was included where before they weren't had ones. Um, I honestly wonder if that may have been for bookkeeping purposes, it was probably easier, uh, but we don't really know for sure. And then of course there were other teachers that were um, uh, teaching on the site as well at the school. So she, um, tells the town that she is closing her school down to white students and reopening for black and brown students. And we're going to be coming from the state. 
and the town was not happy at all to hear her decision to do so. She closes the school at the end of February, and um, by March, the town is meeting at the church across the street. So remember that first you know, image, that woodcut of, of Barbara that had the letter A for Randolph School? Um, that church right across the street is where the town starts having meetings to determine their strategy for closing down the school. The opposition was led by her neighbor, uh, who lived right across the street, across Route 14. Um, if you're familiar with the Canterbury area, there's a little grocery store there now. So I love the poetic justice that his house has gone and, and her school still family. Um, but his name was Andrew Johnson. And, um, you know, he was, uh, you know, a very prominent individual. He was the state senator, and he was the attorney, the state attorney for Wayne County. And he used all of his political and uh, professional networks to close her school down. The first student that arrives from out of state is a 16-year-old young woman named Eliza Hammond. She's from Providence. And they first threaten her with a vacancy law. They say she has to be out of town within two weeks or she'll have to face a fine and a public whipping. Uh, the abolitionist movement at this point is starting to galvanize and really throw their support behind Crandall and the school. So they put a bond to the town saying that none of the students are going to be a burden on the town. So Eliza Hammond can say. Um, the town realizes they've been thwarted. So Judson uh, writes what becomes known as the Black Law. Um, we colloquially refer to it as the Black Law, but what it is, is really an addendum to the larger vacancy law. And it essentially says that it is illegal for African Americans to enter the state of Connecticut for the purpose of receiving an education without prior town approval. So if an African American person wants to move into the state of Connecticut to buy a farm, purchase other land, to take a job, to start a business, they can do that to get an education. Now you need the town's approval where the school is. So it was designed to close this school down. Oh, oh, I want to mention real quick, um, the little text that is on the bottom there, that, that was a short quote. Last evening, the news reached us that the new law had passed. The bell rang and the cannon was fired for a half an hour. Where is justice? The town was celebrating across the street on the green when this law was passed. And that was a quote uh, from one of the students that was published in The Liberator. Garrison was publishing the experiences of, of the students. They were writing um, essays and letters to the liberator, and he would then publish them. He published them anonymously because as it starts getting more and more heated, their lives are, are in danger, frankly. And so publishing them anon anonymously um, protects them, keeps them safe. Um, well, Crandall, you know, certainly um, had her detractors and her opposition. She had supporters as well. And um, her staunchest supporter ends up being a um, minister, a reverend. His name was Samuel J. May. He was a Unitarian minister from Brooklyn, Connecticut. And I want to mention to you that his church is still standing. Um, it still is a, a, a UU congregation today, but I, I just love the fact that, you know, there's this other historic building that uh, people can visit connected to this story. And um, he was one of the people that tried to talk at town meetings um, on Crandall's behalf, and they would not let him speak. Um, he wrote articles, he helped raise funds, like the ones for Eliza Hammond that I mentioned. And uh, the town really starts a dual process of both legal prosecution and persecution and intimidation uh, toward the students. So they're throwing stones through the windows of the school. They are throwing eggs. William Burley, who is a male teacher, so he's not spending the night at the boarding school, of course, he's leaving in the evenings. There are a group of boys that egg him as he's trying to go home for the night. Um, that intimidation increases and gets more violent as uh, Crandall continues to run her school. Um, but you can see that she certainly needs the support 
the town stores, with the exception of one uh, business person, will not sell them anything. So you have to have people go out further afield to bring supplies to them. The churches close their doors and will not allow the students to attend Sunday services. Uh, Reverend May's church, of course, would welcome the students. And there were a few others, again, further afield that would, would welcome the students. So the Black Law that I mentioned gets passed in May, the end of May of 1833. And a month later, Prudence Crandall is arrested for breaking that law. A lot of people don't know that both she and her sister, Hannah Elmira, were both arrested. Uh, Hannah Elmira was under 21, which was which meant she was still a minor. And so she was released. But Prudence Crandall um, was arrested and spent one night in jail. And it was a little bit of a, of a acknowledged publicity moment for her. She and the Appalachians were aware that this was probably going to happen. And so they had decided ahead of time that they were not going to pay her bonds. And it was it was a smart move. Um, she does spend one night in jail and it gets national and international coverage. Crandall becomes a cause to let. She is a household name, whether you're for or against her decision to teach African American young women. Um, you know her name, you know her family's name. Um, and the opposition looks really bad because, you know, what's being published in these papers is this, this respectable woman is put in jail simply for educating people. And they realize it was a moment that they lost, and they certainly don't let that happen again. Um, but uh, she spends one night in jail, and the next day uh, she is released, and um, she has to go to trial. In the meantime, the students are still arriving. Uh, Crandall, if she had the roster, we've never been able to locate one. It doesn't seem that she did. We don't have one for when uh, she was teaching white students either. Um, and it could potentially also have been like Garrison publishing the students' letters anonymously. She may have been um, trying to protect the students and not keeping a list that uh, fell into the wrong hands. Um, but we have found the names of at least 27 students so far who have attended the school. Um, and so they came throughout the time period that, that she was able to keep the school open. And that was about 17 months that they endured uh, the harassment. One of the students wrote to the Liberator, it has been Miss Crandall's utmost care to persuade us not to indulge in angry feelings toward our enemies and feel at peace with all. And they continued to study. Uh, they also say that um, they really felt very welcome and very safe and peaceful. I believe the, the actual quote is, um, love and, and uh, union bind our, our, I'm sorry, I'm not going to put out a paraphrase because I'm not putting it well. Uh, but love and union, uh, they bound us together in sisterly affection. Um, they really felt comfortable in the, uh, the space that they were in um, and within the walls of the school. But remember, once they walk outside, you know, they're subject to verbal abuse, um, boys would blow horns and bang drums. Where's your bathroom? It's outside because you now have to know the plumbing. Um, there was definitely a barn on the property. We don't know if Randall had cows or milk or chickens or a vegetable garden. The point is you couldn't always be indoors the way you could today. Um, so they did have to leave the property uh, fairly often and that's some of the abuse that they did face when they um, left the building. Um, we do know that the well was fouled, that horse manure was put in the well so that they could not have fresh drinking water. Crandall turned to her father and asked, can you please bring us water from your well? He said yes. He was threatened with physical violence and fines for doing so, and he continued to bring them water. Um, he was very supportive, I should mention, of his daughters and the school, and even wrote to um, the uh, the legislature told them not to pass the black law when he heard that that was in the works. Because remember, you know, what they were doing is getting petitions from, from different towns to pass the law. Um, and then he also wrote to the town and told them very clearly that he was going to support his daughter that as far as he was concerned, they were acting like the same in the Part of uh, had a lot to say. Um, so I want to mention as well that there was an arson attempt against the school. There was a cat 
that was um, uh, found dead on their fence and had its throat slit. It seems to have been the only fatality in these home events. The cat had black and white fur. And then what ultimately closed the school down later was a mob attack against the school which happened. So according to Crandall goes to trial, she has to report trials. And the abolitionists are growing their full support. Arthur Tabin, who is a very wealthy white abolitionist from New York City, is you know, throwing his money behind this. So they are hiring the best lawyers that they can to provide her defense. Her prosecutor is the man across the street whose portrait you saw earlier, Andrew Judson. He's arguing a very simple, what he feels, open and closed case. There was this law, she broke it, she should face the consequences. The defense said, no, 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 it doesn't matter whether or not she broke this law, because this law was unconstitutional to begin with. It does not matter whether or not she broke this law, because these students are citizens of the United States and were born free in the North, they should be able to go to school wherever they choose to do so. And so that's their argument. Their argument is for citizenship. Um, African Americans during this time, uh, even though they may be free and in the North, um, freedom did not equal equality. Uh, they did not have voting rights in some places. Um, they uh, could not, as we talked about earlier, they could not go to school. There were not higher education opportunities for them. Um, so even their very citizenship was in question. And the abolitionists were very aware of this. And so their determination was to make the citizenship argument at Crandall's court case, um, which becomes very important. As I mentioned, this court case, Crandall versus Connecticut, impacts U.S. court cases that made it to the Supreme Court um, years and, and a century later. Uh, so um, there is a, I mentioned the Black Law earlier, but what I did mention, and I, I gave a synopsis of what the law meant, but it's a very long law. Um, section three of that law says that if there's a school that happens to exist that's teaching African-American students without town approval, those students have to testify on behalf of the prosecution. So those students were serving warrants as well, and they were required to testify against their teachers. So you figure you have students that are between the ages of 15 and 20, they're the least privileged people in society, and they're facing a very hostile courtroom, judges, attorneys, they see their Fifth Amendment rights. They get on the witness stand and say, I'm not going to answer your questions because I, I'm afraid I will incriminate this. And it's amazing, they almost save the day. I mean, they're the real heroes of the trial here because, you know, they're, they're playing their Fifth Amendment rights and the very trial itself is about their citizenship. It ends up being what we call today a hung jury. It is not a unanimous jury. Um, they, uh, the, the jury is seven to convict, but five to acquit. So, Crandall has to go back and, and have a, a second trial. Um, and their second trial took place and she is convicted. But all this time, because she's not being, you know, found guilty, she can still operate her school. The moment she gets the conviction, and I want to point out, when I mentioned earlier that Andrew Johnson was working all of his political machinations to close her school down, he gets Judge David Daggett, who happens to be the opposition against that New Haven school in 1831 that I mentioned earlier, to serve as the judge in Wyndham County, even though he's from New Haven, for Crandall's second trial where the conviction occurs. So he has a lengthy explanation for telling the jury to convict and why the citizen or, citizenship argument should not hold the jury to this. But of course, Crandall's defense appeals right away. So again, while we're waiting for the appeals trial to happen, she can continue running the school. So Crandall's um, appeals trial happens in July. And I won't get too much into the weeds of that, but if you want to ask me any questions, I'd be happy to, to talk about it in more detail. But essentially, David Daggett does position himself on that panel as well. And um, what happens is you have three 
judges that don't want to disagree with his conviction. So what they decide to do is throw the case out on technicality. They claim instead that the warrant was not written on the record. Um, so on the night of September 9th, 1834, there is a mob that attacks the school. Uh, Crandall's court case gets thrown out in August, and she has been able to continue to run her school for 17 months through all of this harassment and legal prosecution. Because the case gets thrown out on the technicality, there's no determination, acquittal, or conviction, she can be arrested for an element and go through this whole process again. Um, but she's been able to keep the school going. More students are arriving. The town is incensed because their opportunities to close the school down um, have not borne fruit. And then they also have to wait to restart the process. That's when they decide to the school. They take the law into their own hands and um, a mob breaks all of the windows. This happens in the middle of the night. And depending on the primary source, uh, they seem to have gotten into the first floor and uh, um, ransacked it. Um, none of the students beyond the terror and the trauma that they experienced that night were physically harmed, but there would probably be a next time because as I mentioned, the escalation of violence was, was significant. Um, and so that's when Crandall makes the decision that she can no longer guarantee the safety of the students at that time. So she closes the school down. And I want to put that in a little bit of context of what's going on nationally during this period. In 1833 and 1834, there were significant race rights against free Black communities in Providence, in Philadelphia, and in New York City, the exact locations where these students are from. So they have families that are experiencing this, loved ones, friends. Um, earlier, I showed you an image of the advertisement that um, was placed in the Liberator. One of the first names on that list was a um, African American minister, and uh, his name was Reverend Peter Williams. Peter Williams, during one of those riots, lost his church and his house. And he was a direct supporter of Randolph School and was recommending students attend. So they knew people directly. So Canterbury is kind of following in the footsteps of what's happening in these larger cities. In fact, they probably felt emboldened enough to do this because there were no consequences uh, to, the, to the white rioters that were attacking the free black communities in these other um, locations. Randolph herself in 1834 tries to move her school down to Philadelphia. And she actually meets with Lucretia Mott and other Quakers and um, has conversations with them. This is actually how she spends her honeymoon. She, she marries in August of 1834. Um, the flying horse race rides occur shortly after she leaves. No connection to her visit. However, um, many of the white Quakers get cold feet. They decide that, you know what? They don't want Crandall in the area that may cause more tension. Um, so Lucretia Mott was pretty livid when they told her she would have to tell Crandall to move her to school to Philadelphia. Um, but when this event occurs in September, she closes the school in Canterbury down. And as I mentioned, she married. So her husband um, is now the property owner because of the laws of coverture during this time period, even though she owned the property, the moment she says, I do, the property becomes uh, her husband's. And so he puts the building for sale and moves her to uh, Boonville, New York, um, where he was from. Go to the next slide. So here's another quote from the students. I love adding their voices to, to this talk. I have found among them simple manners and intelligent minds. My teacher was ever kind. She lived like those who seek a better country. And it's all past tense. Of course, they're ready after the school had closed. This is a picture of the graph of Prudence Crandall uh, about 30 years after the events that took place here. So she was in her 60s. And at this time, she was living in Illinois. Um, at least five, and I think we're up to seven now, of the students that we know went on to become teachers as well. But most of the students became leaders and teachers and um, uh, activists 
um, real uh, significant members uh, of their communities, and uh, several of them went on to national and international prominence. Um, two of them, actually three I'm going to mention here, uh, Julia Williams probably uh, becomes the most nationally prominent um, during her lifetime. She continues her education at the Noyes Academy in Canaan, New Hampshire. She was also the oldest student um, that attended the Canterbury Female Boarding School. She was 22 years old at the time. She goes to Canaan, New Hampshire, which um, has a school there that is not only integrated, but it's also poet. So black and white students are attending, male and female students are attending. And she ends up meeting there the man who will eventually become her husband, Henry Helen Barnett. But that school also falls to mob violence as well. And um, almost a year to the date, about uh, August 10th was the day that that school in 1835 uh, was attached. They put a large chain around the school, attached oxen, about 100 oxen, and took them a couple days, and they physically pulled it off the foundation. Um, and so she later uh, finishes her education at the United Institute, where she reconnects with Arnett, and they marry. He becomes a minister. They become missionaries in um, Jamaica for a while. She starts a, a um, industrial school for young women there. And you know he's a contemporary of Frederick Douglass, and so he's on the lecture circuit, and he's disagreeing with Douglass and um, William Lloyd Garrison about um, whether or not war is going to happen. Because Douglass and Garrison, you know, I'm very paraphrasing here, um, feel that abolition and emancipation can occur peacefully, and Barnett's own non, I'm, I'm foreseeing conflicts here. So he's essentially saying that we're probably going to go to war. I mean, look at John Brown, right? You know, that events in Kansas are occurring. So uh, when they return to um, the United States, he becomes the first African-American minister to preach a sermon to the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, I am hopeful there are pictures of Barnett. I'm hopeful at some point we'll, we'll discover one of, of uh, Julia as well. Um, Mary Harris was Sarah Harris's younger sister. Mary Harris, actually, if you go to the next, the next slide, I have a, an image of her. This is Mary Harris later in life. Um, she uh, becomes a teacher as well. She marries a teacher from Norwich, Connecticut. His name is Colin Williams. But during the Civil War, they, with their young children, this is 1863, go down to New Orleans. I can't, you know, just believe how brave that was. I don't know if I would have the strength to do that. Um, but they went down and they started teaching the newly freed African Americans. Um, they become so well known as teachers that they're asked to help start a college, which they do. It uh, was known as Straight College. And Mary is listed as teaching in the English department. And her husband, Helen Williams, was um, managing the um, normal school, which was the teaching department of the college. Uh, Spring College becomes Diller University, which is a recognized HBCU today. So while Sarah Harris who originally wanted to be a teacher, it was her sister, Mary Harris, that continues that legacy of education. Her son becomes a well-known principal. The woman he marries, Sylvania Williams, who became so well-known as a teacher that there are schools in New Orleans to this day that are named after Sylvania Williams. So again, you see that, that, that thread continuing through the generations. Sandra Harris herself um, marries a blacksmith named George Fairweather. They lived in New London, Connecticut for a little while. She gets heavily involved in the abolitionist movement. She works with Frederick Douglass. Um, she and her husband eventually settle in Rhode Island um, in Kingston, and her house is still standing. It's a craft guild, um, so you can actually walk in, in the house. It's not a museum. Um, and uh, her house becomes a spot on the underground river. So she stays involved in um, abolition and eventually does go out to visit Crandall many, many years later uh, in the 1870s. But uh, we can continue the next slide. Um, the legacy of what the students go on to do is just one part of um, the story here. There's another legacy here, and that is the legacy of Cranwell versus Connecticut. Um, the 14th Amendment is one of three Reconstruction Amendments to get passed after the Civil War ends. And the 14th Amendment is the amendment that says 
that anyone born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen of the United States. That was not said in the US Constitution until its amendments. That comes, the language of section one of that amendment comes directly out of William Ellsworth's arguments on the appeal of the trial of Prudence Crandall. And when you come visit the museum uh, this summer, um, I will show you the uh, on the exhibit panel. You'll be able to you know, reflect and, and see the uh, text here and William Ellsworth's own words. Crandall and the abolitionists, their goal was to continue to appeal her court case to the U.S. Supreme Court because they wanted the U.S. Supreme Court to finally make that decision of citizenship for African Americans. So they were very disappointed when Crandall's court case was running up in the second county because it closed that avenue down before them. The case that finally does make it to the Supreme Court, um, and uh, and uh, that is challenges or, or just a question of, of um, citizenship for African Americans was the Dred Scott court case. Um, Dred Scott versus Sanford goes to the courts and the decision is handed down in 1857. So Prudence Crandall who does not die until 1890, is still alive at this time. She is living in Illinois. And uh, Dred Scott is, is, is suing for his freedom and his citizenship. Robinson Tanny is the justice, the chief justice of the court. And he says that um, essentially, uh, you know, Dred Scott does not have citizenship, he has no rights, and that African Americans have no rights that white people have to respect. He says, and he cites Crandall versus Connecticut as precedent, saying that because in Connecticut in the 1830s, Connecticut being a free state in the North did not recognize the citizenship of African Americans then, that should serve to demonstrate the precedent of what should be the law of the land in 1857. Absolutely the worst US Supreme Court case ever. Um, we do not know if Prudence Crandall knew at that time that her court case was, was being used as precedent for Tanny's decision. However, Almost just over a century later, in 1954, a much more positive uh, court case was passed, and of course, we've all heard of Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka. Um, Chief Counsel Thurgood Marshall was working with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and he was arguing this case. He hired a constitutional scholar named Howard J. Graham to research the 14th Amendment because they were getting ready to argue Brown under the 14th Amendment. I believe they used the equality clause at that point in time. Again, I'm not a legal scholar, I've done a lot of research on this. Um, and it was Howard J. Graham that made the connection to the 14th Amendment and Crandall's case. And he said it's definitely the genesis of this case, and it's probably one of the most overlooked court cases in the nation um, for its importance. So when Thurgood Marshall um, uh, prepares his written notes, he argues and cites Crandall versus Connecticut. And again, I actually have the text of, of that in the, in the exhibit as well, if you can see in the museum. Um, and uh, he, he plays Crandall versus Connecticut and William Ellsworth's arguments um, in his written uh, backgrounds uh, before he makes his, his oral presentation to the Supreme Court. So while we're not present for Brown, I really wish we, I could say that they were, um, we did, Crandall versus Connecticut did impact um, Brown versus Board of Education. So think about that, right? Something that happens in Canterbury, Connecticut in 1834 impacts the educational opportunities of millions of Americans in 1954, over 100 years later. I mean, what a remarkable legacy. Talk about kind of continuing that mission of education that Prudence Crandall and Sarah Harris started uh, back in the 1830s. And because it's a law on the books, it still could potentially, down the road, impact education as well, even into the 21st century. So uh, I'm going to wrap this up and, and open up for questions. Um, but just a, a few uh, key points I just want to mention is that Crandall worked with two other women to establish this school and have these conversations and uh, make the right decision and stay committed to that. 
Uh, Crandolph's court cases were connected to the civil rights movement into the 20th century, and the students themselves had legacy as well. They went on to be coordinators in the community as well. So thank you so much for your time, and I'm really hopeful that I can see you again, uh, maybe later this year, actually in Canterbury on site, and uh, to show you the growth.